The sleepy little village of Baldoyle nestles comfortably on an estuary guarded by Port Marnock Point to the north and Hoth Peninsula to the south. This haven proved attractive to our first recorded residents, the Vikings, who sailed their longboats from the Danish coast down by the western islands of Scotland and into the estuary of the main river some 1100 years ago. The fresh water of Maine was availed of to kill marine growth on the hulls of the longboats, and appreciating the lowland tendency to flooding, the raiders probably made their settlement on the high ground at Stapolen. The finding of some coins and other artefacts here lends substance to this belief. The ground at Stapolen, which name incidentally means the House of Poland, a man who was second patron saint of Kilbarrick, has been the longest continually habited site in the area. Richard de Stapolen was here in 1369. The fine farmland stretches from the bottoms of Maine over right to the Hoth railway line. The last owners bought the property from the Fitzsimons family who had been in the parish from Norman times. The old big house was demolished in 1954 and the new house lasted until 1990, although it was ruinous since 1973. The picturesque avenue from the Grange Road passed the house and continued as a right of way across the race course to the Coast Road. Lord Hoth started horse racing near Carr Castle between Sutton and Hoth in 1829. With his wife Emily, he entertained lavishly at Hoth Castle and the day's racing was an excuse for a soiree or dinner party. Thomas was passionately interested in horses and hunting. Indeed, he had installed a herd of deer that would lend the name Deer Park to part of his lands. In 1842, Emily died and racing ended at Hoth. Nine years later, Thomas remarried and he opened a new race course on his own lands at Stapolen in Baldoyle. After some teething problems and vandalism, violence and robbery, the course finally opened as Ireland's first all-enclosed race course in 1863. This mural from the fireplace in the Great Hall of Hoth Castle shows the site of the Baldoyle course. Huge crowds thronged the course, using the new railway service to Sutton or Port Marnock stations. The most important dates on the racing calendar were the Baldoyle Derby, which for many years rivalled the Irish Derby at the Curragh, and the Grand Metropolitan Steeplechase. Because it was founded before either of the other major tracks in Dublin, Phoenix Park or Leopardstown, Baldoyle had received all of the best holiday dates. New Year's Day, St Patrick's Day, Whit Monday and August Monday. All of these were racing dates for Baldoyle. St Patrick's Day was especially popular as it was the only place, along with the dog show at the RDS, where intoxicating drink could be legally purchased on the Feast of the National Apostle. Behind me is the site of the main grandstand here in Baldoyle. A newspaper report of 1860 described it as one of the most picturesque race courses with the sea on one side and parkland on my left. Alas, it is not so today. The carefully manicured lands of 30 years ago are now no more. Instead, the premises are in dereliction. This hill in the centre of what was known as the People's Park was a natural vantage point for the people in this, what we will call, poorer part of the race course. The hill comprises pebbles and gravel washed by the seashore and it is fairly obvious that this particular point was the high water mark of the sea here many years ago. Behind me this stretch of land from the Moyne River right down here straight to the grandstand was the five furlong gallop. One of the fastest gallops on any race course in Ireland or England, probably caused by the quality of the ground. Sea sand made the ground perfect for horse racing. It didn't freeze in winter. In wet weather it never became waterlogged 
and in hot summer it didn't become baked. So therefore it was a very popular gallop for young horses. And was one of the features which made Baldoil so popular with racehorse trainers all over the country. It's universal availability. Indeed, in the very rough winter of 1961, Baldoil was the only race course in Ireland or England that continued racing while everywhere else was icebound. The Haggard of Stapolen House was to become the yard and premises of Grange Builders Providers. This shed was the potato store where girls like Bessie Rooney and Rose Canning spent their long days grading potatoes. In 2003 the Grange business moved to modern spacious premises in the nearby industrial estate. Under the Home Value brand, Grange now provide everything for the builder and DIY enthusiast. The Cosgrave family still personally supervise the business here. Deliveries are carefully planned and their fleet of modern trucks bring prompt deliveries to every part of city and county. Standing proudly overseeing the race course from its site in the centre of the village is St Mary's Hospital and Residential Home. Founded as an auxiliary orthopaedic hospital in 1942 it became one of the best known institutions in Ireland as the Little Willie Hospital. There is hardly a townland in the country that has not had a son or daughter come to Baldoil for treatment. The original buildings were Nissen huts, which had been purchased from the American army as they vacated Cove, or Queenstown as it was then, at the end of the Great War in 1918. The huts were brought in sections to Baldoil by train and re-erected in the garden of the convent, where the nuns opened the Mary Aikenhead Holiday Home for business ladies. This was the forerunner of package holidays, and many young teachers, civil servants, bank clerks and others came from all over England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales for annual holidays. In off-peak times, women came here for weekend retreats, the most notable group being from the infamous Monto Red Light District in Dublin City. The Irish Sisters of Charity came to Baldoyle in 1869 on the invitation of the parish priest Canon Smithick, who was a member of the famous Kilkenny Brewing family. They moved into the part of the building to my left here, which was Sunnyside, formerly the home of Judge Henry Hutton. In 1894, they procured from Mrs Fitzsimons Corner House, a rowdy public house, which was here on this corner. They knocked the pub and built this part of the convent that we see today. You will notice that there are two distinct styles of architecture in the convent building. The nuns, do, having demolished this building, they built a new convent and workrooms. Workrooms that were to become famous because in those workrooms were made socks and shirts under contract for the British Army and many a young lad died in the trenches of Europe dressed in his Baldoyle socks and his Baldoyle shirts. Those workrooms finished in 1918 at the end of the First World War. If we peep around the corner we can see the old parochial house which was built on some Dublin Corporation commonage around 1780. It is now an office block and the railings have been removed to facilitate the parking of cars. Along from Parochial House we come to Parochial Avenue, a picturesque development of neat cottages. To the west of these cottages lies College Street, which includes this cottage, Hawk Cottage, a thatched structure until the 1960s. It was named after a tailor named Kit Hawk who moved to Australia and the house came into the possession of the Howard family. Also on this street, which was formerly known as Back Street, is the constituency office of Michael Joe Cosgrave. 
At the rear is Mangerton, which was the farm home of the Cosgrave family for generations. This fine residence seen here from the back was Park House, one time home to some members of the famous Machines of Blarney woollen millers. It was purchased by the Irish Christian Brothers in the 1890s and they soon purchased the semi-derelict house across the road, Strand Lodge. They opened a juniorate here for boys who were interested in joining the order and hundreds of lads from all over the country came here until after they had completed their intermediate certificate examination, at which stage they transferred to Merino to complete the leaving cert. The Sisters of Charity bought the premises in 1972 and St Mary's Girls Secondary School now operates here. The premises includes St Mary's Hall, a fine auditorium which has for 30 years now been the home of the Baldoyle Musical Society who have won many awards at international competition. The chapel here is a haven of peace in a busy school and has some fine examples of the stained glass work of the Harry Clark Studios. The modern colour scheme makes the chapel appealing to the teenage girls who now comprise its congregation. These two fine old houses dominate the seafront here in the village. The house on your left was the former library, which has been totally refitted, extended and modernised and is now awaiting reopening. This house was formerly the barracks of the Royal Irish Constabulary until the foundation of the Free State and the Garda Sicana. The Gardaí decided not to use a barracks in Baldoyle and it became a residence, lived in by Miss Hannah Clark and her mother, who are sister and mother of Tom Clark, the executed 1916 leader. The house became known as Clarkville. The house on your right was the home of Miles Wreck in the 1860s. Miles Wreck was the secretary of the Belfast Railway Company. A frequent visitor to the house here to visit the wrecks was the artist and songwriter Percy French. The weather mustn't have been great because Percy found time when in Baldoyle to paint 17 pictures on the door panels of the house here. The lady in this picture is thought to be Miles Rex's wife. And in this picture, the clown is thought by many to be a self-portrait. Percy French also referred to himself frequently as the clown. He once said, I was born a boy and have remained so ever since. Other paintings on the doors here are of local scenes, Portmarnock, Baldoyle and Holt. Unfortunately, these doors are no longer here. We only know that one of them is at present in the Percy French Museum in Bangor and County Down. We don't know where the other doors went. Close by these two houses stands the former Coast Guard station. In this building there were nine dwellings which for 150 years up to 1910 housed the men who looked after those who went down to the sea in ships. The central building was the boathouse and this housed the rowing boat which was slid down along a wooden rail from the house to the sea when emergency arose. The Coast Guard were also revenue police. They were involved with the customs and excise and the prevention of smuggling into the estuary. They patrolled the coastline between here and Malahide to the north and here to Sutton and Hoth on the south. This picture which we show you is a woodcut dating from 1822 of Mr Livingston, a wealthy Dublin man who took off on a balloon flight from Portobello Barracks in South Dublin to raise funds for the poor and destitute of South Dublin. Mr Livingston's voyage came to a premature end here in the estuary of Baldoyle. The boathouse here was ultimately converted into a shop, Carrick Stores, owned by Michael Burns, and today it has been reconverted again and is now an apartment block. The Dublin and Drogheda Railway opened in 1844 
with a primitive station at Grange Road, Baldoyle. The plans included this fine station building, but it never materialised, and what was built here was no more than a box to house the ticket seller. The station here only lasted for two years when the branch to Hoth opened and Sutton and Baldoyle station came into use. This station was to become an important centre for the handling of Baldoyle race day trains. There were three special sidings for race day traffic, of which one was an unloading bank for horses. Special trains ran on race days and at times the railway company was unable to cope with the huge number of passengers wishing to travel. Here is what a reporter in the Irish Sportsman and Farmer had to say in the 1860s. And I quote, The station was stormed and carried by a coup de main, and the trains were invaded and people were to be seen swarming all over the platform leaping with the agility of harlequins or lumbering with the ponderosity of a polar bear through the carriage windows with no thought of class distinction. The unwashed hosts carried the day and new hats, coats and boots with old corns, bunions and such like came to grief. In 1901 the Great Northern Railway opened an electric tramway to connect Sutton and Hoth stations via the hill of Hoth, the object being to generate tourist and commuter traffic to the area. The service became a popular summer trip on the open top trams and when closed by CIE in 1959 it was the last remaining tramway in Ireland. One Hoth tram is preserved in the National Transport Museum in the grounds of Hoth Castle. Baldoyle West was not without its big houses. Grange Abbey was one of the best known and stood until the late 1960s right beside the ruined church or abbey which gave it its name. This fine house was reputed to be connected by a tunnel to St. Dulux's Church in Balgriffin. This 1954 film clip shows the interior kitchen of Grange Abbey House a house where Jonathan Swift was a frequent visitor to Mrs. Acheson. Perhaps the good Dean even supped a cup of tea in the warm confines of this kitchen. The church here at the Abbey of Grange, or Grange Abbey, dates from about 1250 and was attached to the Church of All Hallows at Hoggan Green, now the site of Trinity College in Dublin City. Dermot McMurra, King of Leinster, and St. Lawrence of Toul, Archbishop of Dublin, and now patron of the Church of Seagrange here in Baldoyle, were both influential characters in the history of this particular abbey. In 1369, Sir William de Windsor summoned a parliament, a British parliament, to this abbey here. The purpose was to levy taxes and tithes on the people of County Dublin and County Meath. Now, as you might guess, there were no public facilities here and after three days of inclement winter weather with no food this parliament which was dubbed the hungry parliament agreed to all the tithes and taxes that the winds are suggested however the people of county dublin and county meath were unhappy with these results and they elected richard de stapolen again a name that we find in the parish of a townland and Richard Bray of County Meath to go to London to plead the petition against these taxes to the King. The result was that the taxes were overturned. The Abbey remained in use for some two to three hundred years. There are quite a number of people buried in the surrounding area here but in the recent centuries the Abbey has fallen into disuse when from about 1670 the place of worship in the parish of Baldoyle became the mass house on the site of the current church of St. Peter and Paul in the village. Close by stood the picturesque Grange Abbey, formerly known as Bow Park. This house was demolished in June 1990. A fine Queen Anne style house 
one of only three in this country, was named Newbrook House and later the Donaghy's. It was for many years the home of the Dublin baker, Peter Kennedy. Kennedy's bread sticks to your belly like a lump of lead. Grange Moor was the home of Charles Hockey before he sold out to Gallagher Brothers Builders and moved to Abbeville in Kinsealy. In this brief look at Old Baldoyle, we realise that there are many memories of our past. Our last vernacular cottage on Main Street was the home until 2002 of the Rooney family. Outside, the remains of a water fountain are a reminder of more primitive times in the village. The up-pointed shaft of Joe Rooney's horse cart tell of his days working for Dublin County Council. Baldoyle House. A tavern has stood here for generations under various names. Hoey's, Nixon's, Duff's, the Trigo, the White House, to mention but a few. Was this early view entitled The Inn at Baldoyle, which was painted by William Sadler about 1820, of that inn at this location? Or was it the inn knocked down to make way for the convent? Perhaps artistic license has made identification impossible. Another memory is this original doorway on a cottage on Main Street. We now turn our attention to the fine parish church which dominates the main street of the village. The Church of St Peter and Paul was commenced in 1831 on the site of the old thatched chapel which had stood here since the 1670s. The church was built without its transepts. These were added after 1869 to give church accommodation to the Irish Sisters of Charities who had moved in here. The church is still the major landmark in the village to this day. Notice the fine St. Catherine's wheel on the ceiling, said to represent a ship's wheel to the memory of the fishermen who built the church. Each corner sports a life belt in the same vein. The fishing boat motif is clearly carried on the front of Our Lady's side altar. The statue of Our Lady bears a crown, which was presented to the church by a jockey after a triumph in the races of Baldoyle. The seats carry brass memorial plates to the memory of some of our oldest families. One plate commemorates Christopher Farron, whose fishing boat, Heather Bell, was one of the last to fish from the port of Baldoyle. A new sacristy block was added during the 1990s renovations, carried out by Father Liam Murta, parish priest. To each side of the church stand the old school buildings. The boys is to the north and now incorporates the parish office and parochial house. The girls to the south is now a private residence. The girls moved across the road to the convent school in 1890, while the boys moved to the new school on Brookstone Road on a site given by Joe Gill in 1940. Let us take a look now at this cemetery. Once said by Brendan Behan to be the healthiest in Dublin because of its proximity to the sea. Kilbarrick Graveyard, or the ancient Abbey of Moan. Moan being an old Irish word for either a hedge or a sandy place, but in this instance it's probably the sandy place. At one stage in our history every vessel entering the port of Dublin was obliged to pay a levy towards the upkeep of this abbey and graveyard because this graveyard was founded primarily for a resting place for the bodies of those washed up on the seashore. But also space was found here for many of the old families that we knew so well in Baldoyle and the surrounding district down through the generations. We have the Butterley family of Hoth and Baldoyle very wealthy merchants, one of whom married a aunt of Michael Collins. And the grave of John Fitzsimons, the Fitzsimons family synonymous with the house at Stapolen.
for many generations and whose family first came to Baldoyle with the Normans over 800 years ago. Here is buried Captain Kane and his wife Minnie. Captain Kane was a very well known figure in Baldoyle down through the years, a sea captain who lived in Main Street. And here these two headstones beside me of the Penrose family. Quite a number of the Penroses are buried in this large plot. And the Penroses are still very much in evidence in Baldoyle and have been right down through the generations. And somewhere in this graveyard, and we know not where, lie the mortal remains of Francis Higgins, the Sham Squire. A man who made his fortune through trickery, roguery, in the 18th century Dublin. When he died, it was his wish that he be buried here in Kilbarrick. But so incensed were the local people that they desecrated his grave, broke the stone, and some even say that they threw his body out onto the foreshore. So, for all his trickery, for all his roguery, somewhere here in this Abbey of Moan lie the remains of the Sham Squire. As we conclude this brief tour around Baldoyle, situated in the heart of Finn Gaul, which brings together the memory of the dark-haired strangers from Denmark with the fair-haired race from Norway, let us welcome those people who today choose to set up home here. As the sun sets in the west over Stapolen, we close our view on the village and think fondly on those who have worked for centuries to make Baldoyle a better place in which to live.